Welcome to Cities for Everyone, the webinar. Today, we have a most important topic. Yesterday, the United Nations Secretary General had a call to action urgent on climate change. And today, our guest, Herman Enriquez, is going to be doing a presentation on climate change perspective in park management. And he's going to showcase the San Pedro Parks model. We know by intuition that parks can improve our environment, can help the fight against climate change, but we don't really know exactly how. So Herman is gonna be providing examples from around the world on how it actually happens. Herman, thank you very much and welcome. Thank you very much, Gil. All right, I'll share my screen so everyone can see it. Okay, there we go. And here's the presentation. So, uh, well, yeah, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm a big fan of this series. And as you said, they have really helped, uh, well, my team, my elected officials in order to see the importance of public space and especially all the different uh, uh, topics that are so important. So uh, thank you. And um, yeah, just to get started. Well, my name is Germán Enriquez. I'm uh, right now the executive director of San Pedro Parques. I've been a parks professional for almost eight years now. I have a background in environmental engineering and I've been living across the world. Right now, I'm living in Monterrey, Mexico, in the city specifically called San Pedro Garza Garcia, which we will be speaking a little bit uh, further the presentation. So, um, yeah, I'm going to speak today about climate change. And before starting speaking about the different matters, uh, the different ways that parks impact climate change. I was, I, I would love just to recap what is climate change. I mean, uh, first of all, when we speak about climate change, we need to speak about energy. And uh, as we know, in the Earth, where we receive most of our energy is from the sun. So how we deal with that energy of the, uh, from the sun is actually what matters how the climate is, is, is working. Uh, we do receive uh, radiation from the sun and we absorb some of it and we repel some of it. So what determines how much radiation we get and how warm is the, is the planet? Well, it has to do with a layer, an atmospheric layer of gases called the greenhouse gases. The thicker those gases are, the more radiation we absorb, and the less we we uh, the less radiation we get, we let we let it out. So, uh, what determines the thickness of those gases of that layer of greenhouse gases are all these chemical components that you see here. I mean, specifically water vapor. Water vapor is one of the main greenhouse gases we have in the atmosphere, and followed by carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and all other. Uh, kind of gases. So is that a good or a bad thing? It's a really good thing. Actually, that's what makes the earth be a uh, livable, um, yeah, uh, a place that actually we can live. I mean, the earth had, uh, uh, where humans have been able to to evolve and to, to, to thrive, is when the earth has a uh, temperature of 14 degrees Celsius. And this is something we have been monitoring in the last years because lately that temperature has been going up. Why has that temperature been going up? Because all these gases that we that, uh, that I told you that they make up this greenhouse layer, well, human activity has been impacting this in a great way. What are the main activities that we uh, do as humans that affect this? Well, mainly transportation, production of electricity and heat, fuel combustions, industry, I mean, everything that modern societies are based on. And mainly the, the main gas that has been um, working for this is CO2, carbon dioxide. So now that we know that our activities are actually thickening that layer of greenhouse gases, is that uh, that is causing global warming and hence climate change. So that is what we mean when we say climate change is because we are uh, manipulating our atmosphere by the activities that we do. So what are the effects of climate change that we have been monitoring and that we also know that they affect our health? Well, pretty much uh, the increased global temperature has made way for extreme weather 
disasters. That's something that hurricanes, droughts, floods, everything that was once in a century a storm, for example, now it's one every five years or, or, or even if, every year. So all this has changed the way we predict and we adapt and also the change that cities behave. So what are these effects? I mean, drought, uh, pollution, the allergies that, that they are caused by, by the extreme pollution because of these uh, effects are really impacting our health. And not only our health, but also has make us more vulnerable to things that before they were not that common. So this is what pretty much climate change effects look like. I mean, all the wildfires in California, all the hurricanes, even there has been more than level five hurricanes now, like the Patricia in 2015, and uh, floods, droughts, it has really uh, changed the world in ways that we are not talking about climate migration. So uh, who are the people that are more vulnerable to this? Well, there are communities of color, children, low-income communities, older adults. Why? Because they cannot adapt as easily as, uh, as grown-up adults in some positions of privilege. So we need to be really conscious that climate change is also a matter of equity and that cities need to be prepared to, to, be, to be able to fend off all these effects that, from something that is happening. As Gil said uh, yesterday, the UN just announced that we are nowhere close to be able to mitigate all the uh, the transition that we're getting for, um, as I, I was telling you, the earth pre-industrial, uh, pre the, the industrial era was 14 degrees Celsius. Right now we are almost hitting 15 degrees Celsius. And if we hit the point of no return, that is 16 degrees Celsius, that's something that the main positive feedback cycle effects from the water, because water vapor is a greenhouse gas, will make it non, a point of no return. So how can urban parks impact climate change? I'm going to speak about a lot of different examples, but the main thing that I want to speak about is about the roles that urban parks have in climate change. And in order to see this, we need to think about systems thinking. Uh, traditional thinking is usually one cause, one effect, but well, we're speaking about something as complex as, clim as climate change. Uh, we need to think in a systems way. And it, everything is connected, everything is related, and it has different uh, effects depending on what you see. So if you change something, it will change somewhere, something somewhere else in a more complex way. So one of the first things that climate change, that uh, urban parks impact in climate change is for adaptation. Cities need to be resilient. And I'm going to speak about design. Cities need to be redesigned in a way that they can handle all these extreme effects of climate change that we were mentioning, flooding, droughts, extreme weather events. And I cannot think of a better example of this than Copenhagen, Denmark. Copenhagen, Denmark has been preparing for this for a long time. And why? Because Copenhagen is really vulnerable to stormwater damage. Is this an image of uh, how a little rain can affect uh, Copenhagen. So what they did was to invest in their park system in order to do this, make cities sinkable, but not, not, the, not the places where people live, but parks. Parks are there as a resilience element for cities in order to be flooded. So for example, the Copenhagen formula, this is, uh, you have green space, you have uh, maybe, I don't know, 80% of the time, 90% of the year, you use it for recreation, but when you need it the most, it really helps out in order to uh, redirect all the water into these zones, making the city uh, less prone to damages. So the, one of the main examples of this is any heavy parking in, uh, in, in Copenhagen, which is called the climate park. Why? Because it looks like this. It looks like a, a common park, but when it rains, it looks like this. And also, you can have sports fields and they all look like bowls, but when it rains, it looks like this. And this makes it beautiful. It makes it, uh, you are not afraid of these uh, stormwater damages. So not only parks, also boulevards, also streets, cities need to be th thought about how to be designed in order to be resilient. And Copenhagen is one of the best 
best examples for that. But not only Copenhagen is, and then not only in modern days have we been doing this. This is Leon, my hometown, which I love a lot. Uh, back in the 19th century, Leon, which is in the central part of Mexico, used to be really vulnerable for flooding. So what they did in the 1950s was to build a dam out in, in the north because all the runoff from the Sierra uh, Sierra de Lobos, the, the mountains, used to go here. So they did a dam. It was an ugly dam for about 50 years until they transformed it into this, into a beautiful park because the water was already there. So what, uh, what they did was to make it into Parque Metropolitano de León, and now it serves both purposes. It also as a resilient element, but also as a beautiful place that receives millions of people and has thousands of events of recreation every single year. So that is design. The cities need to be redesigned in order to handle all these effects. But also parks, they can help mitigate the effects of climate change. So how they do this, how to do this, and this is a little bit more technical into, into the aspect of how much carbon they can handle and, and how much carbon they emit. Because operating parks also, as any other activity, if they rely on fossil fuels, they do emit emissions. So this is something we need to do for balancing. And this can be applied to parks, but it can be a, must be applied to cities. So you have sequestration in one side for all the natural elements, and you have operational emissions. This is an example from León, uh, from Parque Metropolitano de León. This is the organization I used to direct. And this is a model that can be implemented by anyone. So what are the main emissions from a park? Electric power, fuel, and trash. That is a simplified model. And this is an example of what happened in 2018. Now, how does park help out sequestering carbon? Well, first of all, trees. Trees, you need to measure them through an inventory, preferably I tree something technical that can give you all the environmental data. Also water bodies, uh, there is no bigger carbon sink than the ocean. And if you have lakes, they also contribute a little bit to carbon sinks. And also all these different alternatives that uh, for renewable energy that operating a park can help out. For example, here we have solar panels and that actually uh, saves some emissions. So if we put all these together, a balance, a balance, how much we emit and how much we sequester, we have this amazing number, which is 390 tons of CO2. So a big park, this is a park that is a 370 hectares. It's a, it's a really big park, but how much, uh, it, it is carbon negative in a way that it sequesters more carbon than it emits, but it is only the equivalent of taking out uh, for one year of service of this park of 85 vehicles out of the road. Or if we put it into another way, 100,000 barbecues. I mean, that's something that we really need to take into account that parks are a piece of the puzzle, but we need more and more um, uh, elements in order to mitigate this. So this is a model that we are sharing. I mean, this can be implemented by any up and coming uh, park organizations or cities in order to see how much they can they can have their, their carbon inventory. This is super useful information. As well, uh, I want to share with you something that I learned a few months ago, courtesy of Auckland uh, Council, uh, a big shout out to uh, Pipa and Holly Messi who work in this amazing research. That is not only operational emissions that need to be taken into, into account, but embodied emissions. And what I mean by that is that the parks and this infrastructure that we built, it is made from some materials that can also impact climate change. This is when we put the life cycle element into play. So uh, I want to share this because this is an amazing research that Auckland Council did that they saw how different parks they impacted on climate change in these terms of the carbon inventory. They compare a sports park, a regional park, and a community park, and the results are amazing. First of all, the sports park. This is something, it's the same exercise that we did in Mexico, but in New Zealand, they added this other element that is embodied emissions. I mean, all the materials that were used 
for turf, for um, all the different uh, equipment from the park, how much does it affect? And the results are incredible. These parks, most of the sports park are carbon positive in terms that they they emit more carbon than they actually sequester. And when you see the details, it's incredible. Artificial turf makes 95% of the emissions that this kind of a sports park, uh, sports have had. So this is really uh, groundbreaking uh, things of how important it is to choose materials wisely when building parks. Another, another park is regional park. Here, carbon sequestration, it's really important, but there is something that they was taking into account that it's also quite uh, impressive. The operational emissions, if you take into account visit or traveling, in other ways, how people get to the park by using usual fossil fuels by vehicles, it actually outweighs all the, all the benefits of, of all the trees that the parks have. Why? Because carbon uh, fossil fuels are so much damaging than we can actually keep up with. And this was the main message from the UN yesterday, that we need to change our habits, not only build more things in order to mitigate, but we need to change how we move. So this, excluding visitors, now we see that, yeah, uh, uh, regional parks have a component of sequestering carbon that is super important and they need to have. And then community parks that are the traditional parks, they do have a balance between carbon sequestration and operational emissions, but we see that embodied emissions, how parks are built, are a main thing here. So what we see here for the whole Auckland Parks Network is that they do are post, uh, carbon negative, and that's a good thing. I mean, that means that they sequester more carbon than they actually emit. However, it's super important to take into account embodied carbon. The choices that we make about how parks are made, they impact a lot, and they can even outweigh the benefits of having parks. That's a really strong message that we need to take into account. So, but more than that, how also urban parks impact climate change? And this is something super important, education. There is not a place where people can learn more about the environment, about the role they play in nature than parks. And for example, this is Leon, the same park that I was speaking to you about. This is one year in 2016, there was a, a lake, a beautiful lake of uh, 200 hectares, completely dry. And that same year, it was completely flooded. And then you say, okay, is this normal? No, it's not normal. But that is climate change. That's something that you can feel, that you can live. And parks are the best example for this. So also, one of the main indicators of the that the climate is changing is biodiversity, because birds fly and trees adapt or trees, um, they change depending on the climate. So this is some an experiment that we've been doing lately. Uh, this is uh, a great project. The city on the left is called Chattanooga. I know that there are some people in Chattanooga here. And the city on the right is San Pedro. What do they share in common? Yeah, they're in North America, but more than that, birds. So what we're trying to put is a, a bird monitoring, migration monitoring network between parks so we can actually track how, uh, depending on the best practices we make in parks, how we can uh, see if, if the mi migration patterns, they are changing or they are not. For example, all these beautiful <laughs> birds and, and critters that you see in the screen are, uh, are um, is biodiversity that we share. And not only here, also in Canada, they we know that they come from Ontario, that they come from Quebec, and they go all the way to Mexico, even Central America. And that's something that we need to keep track of. Also, how to use biodiversity in order for this. Uh, in Ireland, they are treating invasive vegetation. I mean, all this uh, vegetation that shouldn't be there, but because of uh, changes in the climate, it's adapting and not, not in a good way by using, for example, grazing, which is a local fauna in order to have more environmental friendly ways of dealing with all this. For example, goats. <laughs> so something else, I mean, more challenges that creates more opportunities. So all these invasive plagues that we've been having, like mistletoe in Mexico, is really ravaging trees. But that creates opportunities of training rural areas in order for them 
to build the capacity to deal with this generating jobs. So not all, all, all is bad. There is also a lot of opportunities in there. Or also park rangers program. We were speaking about education. There is not better educators that people are working parks. And in Latin America, we're uh, just realizing about the importance of park rangers. These programs are spreading all around. And it's, it's great to see park the park rangers, not only the park, but also, also in 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 schools, uh, pre, uh, uh, teaching about biodiversity and creating a role model for all these kids in order to be something. Because as Maya Angel said, at the end of the day, people won't remember what you said or did. They will remember how you made them feel. And parks have a power, an incredible power of making people feel different things that are super important for this challenge that we face. Responsibility. And also... What can we do in order to change it? What can you do in order to change what we're doing that is not getting us anywhere in terms of human survival? All right. So uh, yeah, these were just some examples. And I would like to just point, point out that there is a Climate Change and Resilient Committee in World One Parks where we actually, I'm part of it, uh, is led by Kevin Halpenny and Gavin White as executive officer. Uh, they, we are gathering all these different examples from around the world and we're creating a map of all these climate change and resilience projects that they are happening in parks. Like for example, in France, in Mexico, in, in the US, in San Francisco, Presidio Trust. So all this is available. I mean, I just wanted to say that there is a lot of things going on and we are all connected. And to end my presentation, I just want to talk about San Pedro. San Pedro Park is the city that I'm working now on and that has really made a difference in terms of how a city can uh, be transformed in order to help uh, more than quality of life of the citizens, also the role it plays in climate change. So this is San Pedro Garza Garcia. It's pretty much a really small uh, city, but it's part of a very big metropolitan area, of my Monterrey metropolitan area, and it's in the north of Mexico. So back in 2018, uh, San Pedro used to have a lot of abandoned places. And this is really a picture that has been going on all around Latin America and the world, that public spaces are no longer the gathering place. Uh, they were shopping malls, they were restaurants, nothing bad with that, but they were not really fulfilling its purpose of making a, a, a making community or even people going playing outside. So life quality was decreasing for that. So uh, San Pedro took into account Miguel Trevino, the mayor, to say, okay, well, let's invest in public space. And what happened was an incredible transformation of creating destinations, such as the parks that you're seeing on the screen, El Capitan, Mississippi, Cluthier Park, which is in a really vulnerable side of the city. And, and they invested the most money on that in order to to, uh, to make it amazing, uh, Bosques del Valle. I mean, so what happened is that culture tribe and people went back to the parks and uh, yeah, parks right now, San Pedro is called one of the park cities of, of, of America. So this was the beginning of the emblematic park system. However, and this is something that a lot of colleagues from Latin America will relate, uh, how were parks operated? Well, there were a lot of different tasks that you need to do in parks, but there were a lot of different uh, secretaries and uh, areas that they were taking account. Uh, they, they were um, dealing with that. Nothing bad with it. They were doing a great job, but coordinating this was super hard. So what San Pedro created was San Pedro Parques. It's the first autonomous parks and rec agency in Mexico. And this is something that the main thing is that it is led by citizens in in um, together with the government, but the chair of the board is a citizen. This is with the purpose of bringing quality of life to stakeholders and keep our ecosystems healthy in a continuous way, regardless of public administrations. So this is a model that has been working great in other parts of the world. And now in Latin America, we're trying it. And honestly, with this board that is comprised by really high level um, uh, philanthropists, architects, and uh, anyway, really good people, 
uh, we've been doing a great job at that. This is the structure that we are uh, that San Pedro Park is is handling is conservation, recreation, and support. And as I was telling you, the the main thing maybe in Canada in the U.S. would be like, okay, this is a normal parks and rec agency. Exactly. We finally have parks and rec agencies in Mexico and Latin America, and it's something that has been working really good. So our model is uh, we only came into existence last year. So we need to prove that this model will help with, with uh, will transcend administration because otherwise we'll go back to, well, just treating uh, parks as gardens. And there's so much more than that. So uh, our guideline has been the Green Flag Award, this amazing certification that has really given us the way of Okay, how we how do we know we're doing a good job? Well, by getting green flags. Last year, we managed to have four of our parks with green flags, making it the city with most green flags in Latin America. And that's a great way because this year we're going for one more, next year we're going for three more. And that's a way that we don't say we have good parks. It's an international certification of really high standards that says so. So what are the, to finish up, what are the climate strategies in San Pedro Garza Garcia? So one of the main things is mobility. So uh, the administration right now is building five, 15 minute districts in order to have everything you need in a walkable way. These are the three of the, 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 of the districts. And this is what is going on. Instead of making cities for cars, they're making cities for people. Instead of having all these really wide streets that they could come and go, a lot of, of, of different um, cars, now uh, people of everyone can, can, can go to, to the streets and, and get benefit. All this transformation is really changing the quality of life and also reducing a lot of the carbon emissions from that. Also, we're relying on wastewater for every part. What you see here is a football field, but there is more than that. Beneath it, there is a tank of uh, 1,500 cubic meters, which will hold wastewater, not only for the park, but for all the areas around it. So we're designing parks in order to make, uh, to make way for what we need the most, which is water. That is one of the main effects of, of, of climate change in the North Mexico, drought. So also we are uh, reducing the water needs of our parks in order to have less grass and more natural, uh, natural surfaces. And also we're uh, taking a, um, a big look into which materials are our sports park made of, because we know, as you saw, thanks to Auckland report, that they make a huge impact on how parks they deal with climate change. Also, native trees, that's something we need to go back to. Australia has amazing programs in terms of how to um, uh, migrate from uh, the usual weather, the usual climate that you have to the climate that you're heading to and have the best trees in order to adapt them. And there is a lot of them that they are dying. So what we're doing, we're saying goodbye to them by explaining, for example, calaveras in the day of the death, how this is why trees are also vulnerable to the climate they live in. We're transitioning to electric mobility, something that everyone can do, and there is more and more affordable options. The parks ranger programs, we're keeping close watch to the birds, to the fauna, to what is going on. And also these guys are not only officers, they are educators. They are super important for this. And finally, we are aiming to have carbon negative parts in all ways. We are still putting up our inventory of sequestration, but we know how much we emit by how much we operate parks. So just to end, San Pedro might be a 1,000 part of Mexico, I mean, 130,000 inhabitants of 130 million, but we know that we are the showroom for Mexico and Latin America. So that is a big, big responsibility of how to do things right in order to make change happen. Just to conclude, what I want you to, to be left with is that parks and nature are only one piece of the puzzle in climate change. There is many more strategies need to be made in order to make the change that we need in order to, to survive in this changing world. Also cities must be designed for resilience. Ch climate change is here. 
and cities must be adapted to them. And also changes in park management, the decisions of how parks are made, where parks are made, how parks are made can enhance all these positive impacts that we talk about. But because in the end, everything is connected. All the parks in the world, they uh, have a huge impact in how we see things and how we educate people, how we make them feel. And the feeling that we really need right now is responsibility and also a call to action because we need to change the way things are going. Thank you very much. Herman, thank you very much. What a fantastic analysis on what needs to be done. I think something that came out very clear is that it's not a technical issue. We know what climate change is. We know the impact of parks and trees and green areas on climate change, but now we must do it. And you provided amazing examples from multiple cities of different sizes in different areas of the world. I hope that people that watch the presentation and we'll get this recording and share it with as many people as possible, especially decision makers, people from the media, and anybody else who cares about cities and people. Herman, thank you very much. And I hope that everybody who watch also becomes little by little a passionate advocate on Cities for Everyone.